Welcome to this week's online worship service from Kenmore Community Church. I'm Pastor Mark Rogers. And if you're watching uh, this video on the Sunday that it was recorded, it's Mother's Day. So I want to uh, wish each one of you listening who may be a mother a very happy Mother's Day. Today I'm beginning a new series of messages from the book of Philippians. So I want to encourage you to make sure you have your Bible close by. And actually today we're going to uh, look at the passage that uh, in the book of Acts that talks about uh, the establishment of the church in Philippi before we actually get to the book of Philippians. So open your Bibles to uh, chapter 16 of Acts. And uh, I'll read some of those verses here in just a few moments. But I want to uh, begin our time together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are blessed to be your children, and we thank you for uh, your love and your watch care over us. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy, and uh, Lord, we just want to proclaim our trust in your sovereign control over all things, our, your tr our trust in your infinite wisdom, our trust in your perfect love, and our trust in your unlimited power, for nothing is impossible for you. And Lord, as we come before you today, there are concerns that we each have that we want to bring before you. We need your help, Lord. We pray that you'd fill us with your spirit and you'd give us wisdom and guidance and direction uh, in our lives with the issues that we're facing. We pray for your healing touch on those that are dealing with medical issues. We pray, Father, for your peace that passes uh, all our understanding to guard the hearts and minds of those who may be fearful or anxious today. And we pray, Father, for uh, uh, just your provision uh, for those that uh, are, uh, you know, are hurting in some way and uh, having trouble maybe paying their bills, uh, getting enough food on the table, or getting enough hours at work. We pray for your provision and uh, we trust that you will work in each uh, situation there. Uh, here at uh, Kenmore Community Church, Lord, we want to lift up our families of the week. We pray for Adrian Doyle. We pray for Candy Davis. We pray for uh, Michael and Wyatt Fields. And we pray for Alasia from our youth group. And we ask, Father, that this week these folks would just have a special sense of your presence with them and that uh, you, by your Spirit, would encourage them to grow in their faith and learn to depend more upon you and uh, whatever issues they're experiencing, that they would again sense your uh, wisdom, wisdom from on high, that you would give them discernment and help in uh, whatever areas they may be struggling. We also want to remember our mission focus today, which is the CareNet Pregnancy uh, Centers of the Puget Sound area. We thank you for the work of these centers, Lord, as they assist young women with unexpected pregnancies and give counsel and uh, provide free ultrasounds. And, and um, when these women have their babies, they, they provide uh, diapers and clothing and cribs and strollers and car seats and all of those things that are needed. And so we pray for the ministry of CareNet. We thank you for the ministry of CareNet. Pray that you would provide the financial resources they need and, Father, that you would provide the volunteer resources they need as well. And we pray for their clients. We pray uh, that their clients would choose life for their babies. And, um, Father, that uh, those children would just be a blessing to their parents. And now as we turn to studying your word, we again ask you to um, help us to understand your word today. Help us to see how it applies to our lives. And we thank you uh, for uh, how your Holy Spirit helps us to uh, understand your word. So give us eyes to see and ears to hear today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I mentioned, today I'm going to begin uh, a series of messages from the book of Philippians. Uh, Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison in Rome. And it was written most likely around 61 or 62 AD. And uh, the big theme, one of the big themes in the book of Philippians is the theme of joy. Uh, Paul mentions joy, rejoicing, or gladness at least 19 times in the four short chapters of the book of Philippians. And uh, he mentions joy despite his circumstances, which seem to work against having joy. Uh, 
And I've chosen to preach uh, on this book of the Bible because of that theme of joy. I think over the last year and a half with uh, the COVID pandemic, many of us have have lost our joy. We become disheartened. We become discouraged. We become depressed. Uh, certainly, there's been a lot of circumstances that uh, would lead a person to feel that way. And yet, as believers in Christ, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, we can still find joy. And by joy, the Bible does not mean going around with a continuous grin on your face, and nor does it uh, mean denying grief or sorrow in times of trial. But it does mean an inner state of contentment and thankful, thankfulness toward God for His abundant grace and goodness toward us in Christ. Godly joy is marked by hope in the promises of God concerning our salvation and our future with Him. It is a solid, steady flowing stream that is not diminished by difficult circumstances because joy focus, joy's focus is not on circumstances or on ourselves, but on God and His promises. Now, to understand the epistle to the Philippians, we need to know the background of the church in that city. How did it get started? And so that's why today uh, my first introductory message to the book of Philippians is going to be based on Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 40. So if you have your Bible open in front of you to Acts chapter 16, follow along as I read verses 6 through 40. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. Once we were going to the place of prayer, we were uh, met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl, girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. 
Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come, be, had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, Release those men. The jailer told Paul, The magistrates have ordered you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But, I, but Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. So my main thought for today's message is that the journey to joy is the path of obedience to the Great Commission. Let's uh, think through what we just read here about the start of the church at Philippi, uh, beginning with the Apostle and his team. And you may at this time see, hopefully, a, a picture of Paul's uh, second missionary journey on the screen, where you can see how he traveled from Antioch and up into what is modern-day Turkey, and uh, traveled through a, through, uh, uh, through a few cities there in modern-day Turkey before coming to Troas and then taking a uh, ship and sailing across to what is now uh, Greece and northern Greece where he landed at Neapolis and then uh, moved on by foot to uh, Philippi. So on Paul's secondary missionary, uh, second missionary journey, he and Silas were traveling through Asia Minor, my, modern Turkey, when they came to the town of Lystra, we see this in Acts uh, 16, 1 through 6. I didn't read those verses for you, but you can look at them later. The fact that they went to Lystra shows Paul's courage because on his first missionary journey in Lystra, he had been stoned and dragged out of the city and left for dead. But God miraculously raised him up and he left behind there a small church, among whom was a young man named Timothy. By Paul's second journey, Timothy had established himself as a faithful disciple of Jesus, and so Paul invited him to accompany them on their mission. So these three men, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, uh, left Lystra and they traveled toward the northwest. For reasons we're not told, the Holy Spirit uh, blocked their path to, uh, in a couple of directions where they wanted to go into Asia, and so they wound up at uh, Troas. And it was at Troas then where Paul had this vision of a man from Macedonia calling to him saying, come over here uh, and, uh, and preach the gospel uh, to, to, the, to us. Uh, we need help. And, and so the gospel came to Philippi and other cities of that re region. Now the reason that vision affects you and me is that, it, it, uh, that in... Uh, you know, going into Europe, essentially, as Paul took that ship from, uh, from Troas to Neapolis, he entered into Europe and brought the gospel to uh, Europe. And from there, it eventually came across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States. If Paul had instead turned back toward Asia, who knows whether the gospel would have ever moved in our direction as it did. Before leaving Troas, Paul... Uh, Silas and Timothy were joined by a fourth man, a Gentile physician named Luke. Now the reason we know that is Luke is the author of the book of Acts and up to this point he is recounting uh, the history of Paul's second missionary journey and saying they, 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 but at this point in Troas he says we and so we know that Luke joined Paul and Silas and Timothy in uh, Troas and uh, went with them to uh, Philippi. Uh, we can also surmise that Paul left Luke behind to pastor the fledgling church at Philippi because he uh, narrates, uh, or the narration shifts again back to they in chapter 17, verse 1, and remains that way until Paul sails uh, from Philippi with Luke in 
uh, Acts 20, verses 5 and 6, which was about seven years later. Now, the city of Philippi was founded by Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon, in 356 B.C., and it was located about 10 miles inland from the port city of Neapolis in a region that was the gateway between Europe and Asia. Its population reflected its location, being a mixture from east and west. Philippi was uh, proud to be a Roman colony, which meant that the citizens enjoyed the protection of Roman law. They were exempt from paying tribute, and they were free from the provincial governor, answerable only to Rome. Veterans of the Roman army were often given property there. So about 50 AD, Paul and his companions came to this city in response to his vision. In spite of the broad mixture of the population, there were not many Jews in Philippi. We surmise this because to start a Jewish synagogue required ten men, but Philippi did not have a synagogue. So when Paul gets to Philippi, his normal modus operandi on his missionary journeys was to look for the local synagogue and go there and preach about Jesus. But since there was not a synagogue, he had apparently heard there were some people that gathered for prayer on the shores of a, a riverbank. And so he went in search of that prayer meeting. And that it's there that he discovered a woman, or met a woman, by the name of Lydia, who was a dealer in purple cloth. And as Paul spoke about Jesus as the Messiah, the Lord opened her heart um, to respond in faith. And she was a businesswoman from Thyatira in Asia Minor who sold purple fabric. She was probably a widow, uh, but she and all her household, meaning any children and relatives plus servants, uh, heard the gospel, believed the gospel that Paul preached, and they were baptized. She apparently had a large enough house to accommodate the four evangelists who stayed there with her. And later the church seemed to meet in her home, according to uh, chapter 16, verse 40. Now it was on their way to uh, one of these prayer gatherings by the riverbank that we read uh, that Paul and his companions encountered this uh, slave girl who was uh, demonized or demon-possessed, and the gift that she had as a result of that was the ability to uh, tell the future. Well, just like in the Gospels where we know, you know, the demons recognized Jesus, this demon within this slave girl recognized Paul and his companions as being uh, servants of the Most High God. And so she began following them and calling out uh, who they were <clears throat> in a loud voice, which you think wouldn't really be that big of a problem. However, uh, you know, Paul and, and his companions were, were trying to keep a little bit of a low profile, and it was just aggravating that she kept following and, and calling out, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you how to be saved. And so after a number of days, uh, finally Paul grew annoyed, and he cast the demon out of the girl. Luke doesn't tell us whether she was converted to faith and trust in Christ at this point, but I'm uh, inclined to think that she was. Now, as a result of this, uh, the owners of this slave girl found out what happened, and they were making a lot of money from her ability to tell people's future and fortunes. So they haul Paul and Silas uh, before the uh, magistrates of the town. They accuse them of being Jews and stirring up uh, trouble and uh, they wind up getting flogged and put in prison. Now it's interesting that Timothy and Luke were not arrested and thrown in prison, and that's likely because they were uh, Gentiles and not uh, Jews. And so it was Paul and Silas who were deemed to be the rabble-rousers and the troublemakers, um, and they were painted as being anti-Roman. And it's about this time that uh, the Roman Emperor Claudius had expelled all Jews from Rome, so anti-Semitism would have been strong in this colony as well because it prided itself on its Roman citizenship. Well, while in jail, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners uh, were listening. And we might ask ourselves, or be inclined to ask ourselves, you know, where is God in all this? Uh, remember, the Lord had seemingly led Paul and Silas to Philippi in a distinct way. 
And so we might be led to uh, think that he had forgotten them, uh, had Paul somehow missed the signals. But no, that was not the case. Paul had not missed the signals. God had not somehow uh, forgotten them. Uh, and that's evidenced by the fact that while they're in prison, singing hymns and praying to God that there's a violent earthquake that, uh, you know, basically uh, shakes the, uh, the uh, uh, jail to its core and the, 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 uh, the doors open wide and uh, the prisoners, if they wanted to, could have just escaped. Uh, but they didn't do that. The jailer uh, comes running into the prison and uh, he, he, he sees that the doors are wide open and thinks that all the prisoners have escaped and, and being responsible for them uh, he, he thinks he's going to get in great trouble and so he's ready to commit suicide when Paul speaks up and says, hey, uh, don't, don't do that, we're all still here. And um, uh, it, it winds up with the jailer and all of his household being saved. The jailer says, you know, as a result of these circumstances, he's just overwhelmed and uh, obviously drawn to the Lord at that point. And he says, what must I do to be saved? So Paul and Silas share the gospel with him and he and his whole household that night, in the middle of the night, come to faith and trust in Christ and are, are baptized. Well, the next day, the magistrates uh, say, hey, we, we got to get rid of these guys. Uh, tell them to leave. They're free to go. And uh, Paul and Silas uh, refused to leave under those terms. They had been publicly flogged and thrown into jail. And so uh, they say they're not going to leave until uh, the magistrates come and po apologize to them. After all, uh, they, were, they, they are Roman citizens and they had been tried and, and, or they had been punished and thrown into jail without a, a trial. They were, they were unjustly uh, punished and jailed. And so when the magistrates find out that Paul and Silas are Roman citizens, they get very anxious about that and they do come and in person try to appease Paul and Silas, apologize for their actions and uh, escort them publicly out of uh, the jail. By the way, Paul's insistence that the local magistrates personally come and apologize was not a case of asserting his rights for his own sake. He did it to protect the church there in Philippi. If he had quietly been let out of jail and left town, the church would have been ridiculed as being started by some Jewish rabble-rouser. But when the news of the magistrate's mistake spread, it gave credibility to the church because the word spread that it was founded by a Roman citizen. With that background uh, sketch, uh, looking at the establishment of uh, the church there in Philippi. Let me draw a few lessons from the account in Acts 16 of the founding of the church in Philippi and relate these lessons to the book of Philippians. By the way, I encourage you over the next few weeks uh, to read through the book of Philippians two or three or four times so that you really get a sense for it. But for now, let's uh, look at four lessons from Acts 16. The first lesson is there is joy in God's sovereign call to proclaim the gospel. As we think about the journey to joy, which the book of Philippians is really all about, uh, there's joy in God's sovereign call to proclaim the gospel. God is sovereign in the task of evangelism. We saw that in Acts 16. He devised the plan of salvation. He sovereignly sent Jesus as Savior at the appropriate time, and he draws people to Christ by his Spirit. He sovereignly directs his chosen servants here in this chapter, uh, forbidding them from going to certain locations and revealing to them where they should go um, to proclaim his good news. Thus, in Paul's vision, he saw the man from Macedonia appealing to him, come over to Macedonia and help us. God has chosen to use his people to help lost people learn the way of salvation. And lost people today need our help in finding Christ. And God is going to lead us to the people that he is drawing to himself. And we go in obedience to Christ's commandment. Whether it is to talk with a lost neighbor or to a stranger that we happen to meet while we're out doing our errands. Or to, to uh, cross cultural or national borders to take the good news to people. We experience great joy as God uses us to help people meet, know, and follow Jesus. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity 
to share the gospel with somebody. But let me tell you, it's one of the most joyous uh, things that can happen to you as you have the privilege of sharing your testimony and telling people about how much God loves them and cares about them and how Jesus died for them on the cross. And, and when they put their faith and trust in Christ, it just, you know, it warms your heart. It's one of the most uh, joyous things that you can be a part of. As you read Philippians, you see Paul's joy overflowing. And the reason he was filled with joy is that he had been obedient to God's call to proclaim the gospel there in Philippi, and they had responded. And even in his present circumstances, as we're going to learn more about next week when he penned the uh, book of Philippians, or the letter to the Philippians, he was in jail in Rome. But even in those present circumstances, being imprisoned, the gospel was going forth, and Paul uh, rejoiced over that. A second lesson we can learn from Acts 16 is that there's joy in the difficult, uh, in the difficult circumstances we encounter in proclaiming the gospel. Uh, somehow we've developed the false idea that if we obey God, we will be exempt from trials. I often hear people lamenting during times of suffering, uh, saying something like this, you know, I was trying to please God, I was trying to, to do what God had asked me to do. And the question is, is uh, clear then, you know, why didn't God protect me? Why did God allow this to happen to me? I was doing what he asked me to do. But such an idea is never taught in the Bible. When you read the book of Acts and see how God's obedient messengers suffered as they proclaimed the gospel, it becomes obvious. Paul had joy in disappointing circumstances. In his vision, he saw a Macedonian man. When Paul got to Philippi, um, all he had to start with was, you know, this small group of women, this woman's prayer gathering uh, at the shore of the, the river. And uh, how can you start a church with just a few women? Where were the men? But Paul faithfully spoke to them. God opened their hearts, and the church began. In Philippians 1, 15-18, Paul mentions the disappointment of uh, those who proclaimed Christ from selfish ambition rather than from love. They were trying to cause Paul distress in his imprisonment, but he still had joy in that situation, knowing that the gospel was being proclaimed, even if the people's motives were not right. Paul also had joy in persecution. In Acts 16, with their backs oozing blood and their feet in stocks, Paul and Silas sang hymns and praise, hymns of praise to God and were praying out loud to God with the other prisoners listening. And in Philippians 1, 12 through 14, Paul rejoiced even in his imprisonment in Rome, since he was seeing the gospel spread through the Praetorian Guard that was shackled to him on a daily basis. The guards were rotating. We'll talk more about that when we, we talk about those verses next week. But the reason he could rejoice in such difficulties was that he believed in a sovereign God who was at all times in control, working all things together for good who tho for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. As the earthquake in Philippi showed, God indeed was in control, even though the situation immediately preceding the earthquake uh, would have seemed to say that God was not in control. The fourth lesson I think we learn from Acts 16 is there's joy in the con conversion of lost sinners in response to the gospel. When the Philippian jailer and all his household believed, they all rejoiced greatly, just as Paul rejoiced in his remembrance of how God had powerfully saved the Philippians, as he records in chapter 1 of Philippians, uh, verses 3 through 8. Whenever people are genuinely saved... Uh, there is demonstrable evidence in their changed lives. Lydia and her whole household were saved, and, and she became then very hospitable uh, to Paul and his companions, invited to them to stay in her home, and she provided for him. Now, if the slave girl was converted, and I think after being delivered from this demon she likely was, you can be sure that she abandoned her occult practices and joined with the other Christians in following the Lord. Her, her mental state, her physical state, uh, all were blessed and improved. Uh, the jailer was delivered from suicide, uh, and he washed the wounds of Paul and Silas. He was baptized and joyfully showed them hospitality.
The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It's life transforming and changing, and it brings great joy to see sinners who were living for self transformed into saints who now live to exalt Jesus Christ. And the fourth lesson I think we draw from this chapter 16 in Acts is that there is joy in the power of the gospel to unite people in uh, Christ uh, from diverse backgrounds. Think about this church in Philippi, how it gets started. First, there's this group of, of God-fearing, likely Jewish women gathered for prayer on the banks of the river. They come to faith and trust in Christ. Lydia and all her, her household, so uh, the servants as well as the extended family members. And, and then we have this slave girl. Who, who likely comes to faith and trust in Christ. And then we have this jailer, this Gentile, this likely a retired Roman soldier uh, who's running this jail who comes to faith and trust in Christ and all his household. And, and this diverse group of people comes together in Christ, in unity, and forms the church there in Philippi. It, uh, you know, it, it defies explanation, but that's the power of God. That's the power of the gospel. Church growth experts in, in, the, pre, in you know, the last 20, 30 years have said if you want to grow a church, you've got to you know, target a particular group of people, and the church needs to be you know, a homogeneous church. Everybody from the same background, whether it's you know, you're targeting young families or you're targeting um, college educated people, whatever it might be, but that, that's human wisdom. That's not God's wisdom. God has broken down the dividing walls of hostility, whether it be race or economically or gender, whatever it might be. In God's church, there is great, meant to be great diversity, and so we see that here in, in um, the start of the church in Philippi. There's great diversity of people coming together in Christ, in unity, to begin this church. Now that doesn't mean there weren't problems, there weren't issues, but again, God's Spirit uh, helps us to be humble and to, uh, you know, find strength in the midst of diversity. So there's great joy um, in the power of the gospel to reunite people together in the church from diverse backgrounds. Well, what can we uh, do when we think about how this applies to our lives? There may have been some applications that were suggested uh, to you or came to your mind as, as I worked through some of those um, uh, lessons that we learned from Acts 16. But the bottom line is, uh, do you know the joy that comes from being reconciled to Christ, um, to God through Jesus Christ? Do you know that joy? The joy that Lydia experienced, the joy that that slave girl likely experienced, the joy that the jailer and all his household likely experienced. Do you know that joy of being delivered and, and from your sin and reconciled to God through Jesus Christ? If not, I encourage you, put your faith and trust in Jesus today. Proclaim your faith and trust in him. Accept his grace and his mercy and uh, the forgiveness of your sins that is provided for by Jesus' death on the cross. You can do that simply by telling him in prayer that you acknowledge Jesus died for you and you invite him by his spirit to come in and, and take charge of your life and renew you and transform you. And if you've already done that, do you know the joy that comes from obeying Christ's great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. This is why Paul could find joy even in the midst of difficult circumstances because he knew he was living in obedience to Christ. And you and I can find joy in that same way by obeying uh, God's great commission. Ask the Lord this week to lead you to somebody that he is drawing to Christ and to give you the opportunity to tell them about Jesus or in some way, shape, or form, as I like to say, to leave the fingerprints of the kingdom of God on their life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy that we can find in relationship to you, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. We thank you for what we can learn about joy uh, from Paul's experience in planting and starting this church in Philippi.
And Father, I pray that if there's anybody listening today who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus, that today would be that life-changing day for them when they could experience the joy of the Lord by putting their faith and trust in you and, and having the Holy Spirit enter into them and uh, this lifelong journey of uh, walking with you and growing in you can begin for them. And for those of us who've already made that decision, I pray that you would help us to live in obedience to the Great Commission, that, Lord, you would open our eyes to see the opportunities around us each and every day to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others and to leave the fingerprints of the kingdom of God on their lives. I pray that you'd give each of us that opportunity uh, this week. Lead us to someone, Lord, uh, that you need us to serve and to minister to and to share the love of Christ with. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name. Amen.